So the uh, second um, presenter of the paper entitled A Truly self Sovereign Identity System. Um, I don't know if Kenton is talking, is here with us. I'm here. Okay. So please present yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much. You have 20 minutes. Great. It's the wrong button. Let me actually make that full screen. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Quinton Stocking, and today I'm indeed here to present to you my paper, A Truly Self Sovereign Identity System. I wrote this paper together with my colleagues, Georgi Ishmaev, Dick Apema, and Johan Powelson. Now, I saw in the introduction today that you're not all from Europe, and that is great because then I hope to teach you all something new and exciting. Because for the past three years, we have worked with the Dutch government to establish a completely new radical type of digital identity called self-sovereign identity. Now, we've been around the world, we've made some prototypes with the government, but what is the problem here? Why do we need this completely new digital identity? Well, because I have 20 minutes and I want to have some fun, I devised for you a... a, a tragic storytelling with some, some nice imagery. And I'm going to take you along in this train of thought. So imagine you are on the internet. Now, the internet, the, the idea of the internet is that it's a beautiful place where you can simply connect to strangers. And what can you do when you're connected to a stranger, say, say through 6G? You can go to them and ask them, please, sell me a mortgage. Now, the only logical response to a complete stranger coming up to you and asking for a mortgage is, who in the world are you and why would I give you any money? Now, what we have here is a problem of identity, right? So as soon as you are identified over the internet or whatever medium you use, you can really do business. And indeed, this is what has materialized, especially on the internet. You can simply contact your local centrally governed identity provider, say your, your Apple, your Amazon, your Microsoft, your Google, your Facebook, and you can get yourself an identity. Well, sounds great, right? You, you can just pick up an identity and go, but there is one small problem here, and then that look no further than Wikipedia to see why this is an issue. If you look at the list of data breaches on Wikipedia, something to... to, to Let's sink in here. We have lost more identity records than we even have people in the world. That is a small problem. Now, what did we in the European Union, for example, also see as the main issue here? Well, we said that the main issue is that we are tied to centrally governed platforms to digitally identify. Now, just identifying is not enough, of course. We also want a solution for identification to be privacy preserving. And because we work with the government a lot, we also want to make sure that this solution is at least able to serve as a digital analog for a physical passport. Now, what is the new shift in thinking that occurred here to make this possible? It's called self-sovereignty, hence the name self-sovereign identity. Now, what this paradigm shift really is, is, is a focus away from these centrally governed identity providers and a focus on the individual that presents an identity. So that, what does this mean concretely? That means that if you own an identity, you collect your own data, you manage your own data, and you share it when you see fit. Now, if you think about this, this is actually just really a natural way of doing things. This is not a shift at all. This is how we do business every day. And if you're not seeing this, I prepared an example for you, of course. So let's look at how this would work when you want to convince somebody you are born on a certain date. Well, when you come into existence, when you're born, of course, you have a birth date, the government will see this. And if they agree with this birth date, of course, they will deliver to you a beautiful piece of paper, which is called a passport. And what you can do now with this passport is, of course, in case you need to convince somebody of your birth date, say if you go to a liquor store and you want to buy alcohol, you need to show them that you're over 21. So what do you do? 
you take your passport, show it to the liquor store. And of course, if the liquor store trusts you and your government, they will see that the passport is real and indeed be convinced that you are over 21 and eligible to buy alcohol. Perfect. So what is the natural mapping in the digital world of this physical model? A really self-sovereign model? Well, be prepared, everything's changing or not. It's the exact same, but the terms are different. So we now have the subject as the center of attention. He makes a claim, which was previously your birth date. An issuer, which was previously our government, attests to this, so gives you your passport. You're done with the issuer. You can now do business with somebody who needs to verify your information. So indeed, on the left side, you see our verifier wants to verify something, say your birth date, and you show your attested claim to this verifier and prove that you are indeed for example, over 21. Now, indeed, this is very natural, but there's a real, real, real shift here. What I've recreated with this new self sovereign model, we have digital autonomy. We can finally do business on digital marketplaces like blockchain, for example. Now, that is not to say that just because it's natural, it's completely worry free. There are issues here. Now, some are some problems with the conceptual model of interaction in a self-sovereign identity system, and some are actually quite practical. So I'll hit you with one conceptual one, the big precarious balance between disclosing data and owning actions. Now, the first one is, well, I guess quite obvious if you do any business online, you do not put all of your identity information on the internet you do not put your social security number on Facebook. Second one is maybe a bit more difficult to understand. So of course, again, I have for you an example. Imagine you own a bank. Imagine you have a shiny new identity system you hooked up on this, and you gave your employees certified employeeness. So you can see every single individual that is employed there. Now, suppose as the owner of this bank, one morning you wake up and you find that all the money in your bank vault is missing. What do you do? Well, you check your access logs. And what do you see there? That there was a perfectly certified employee that walked into your bank vault, took all your money. And of course, the next step is, what do we do now? Well, in this case, nothing, because you do not have enough information to tie this identity to a natural person. Clearly, what we needed in this situation is a bit more data. So there is really a balance to be struck between providing just enough data, but not too much that everybody can see who you are exactly and reuse your identity. Now, I promise you also, next to this conceptual problem, some real practical problems. So let's look at one. What if somebody steals my device, right? Can I just use my mobile device that I loaded all of my identity information onto and then claim to be me. Well, this is actually just one of the many facets. So how do we solve all of these things? Let me give you some examples. I'm not running you through all of them. First one we just saw is authenticating the holder of the device. So what do you do in practice? Well, you scan a face as we did for our prototype. You can use unclonable functions like puffs, if you know the term. At the same time, you still have that nasty thing where you have to disclose data, so you need cryptography. You have the need for people to communicate without the central governance. If we have this central platform introduced again to enable all of these faults in these systems, of course, we're just right back where we started, so we need to keep those out. If you remember still my bank example, at some point you need to catch the criminals. So how do you dereference pseudonyms, as we call them, the keys that are used to log in, back to a natural person. Well, clearly, not everybody can do this, right? So you need some sort of access management in the system. And the last example I want to give you is, suppose you commit some unspeakable act somewhere and you are no longer allowed to cross the border, so the government revokes your passport. Now, the act of revoking by some authority, say the government, means there is information going from a government to the border patrol. And how do you share this information? Well, one thought, for example, is to use uh, well epidemic algorithms, so like a 
gossip uh, protocol over an overlay network or who knows, maybe even blockchain. Now, there are many other facets. We don't even talk about them all in our paper, but we group them into three main categories. First one is disclosure. So this is really just transmitting the data from one end in the network to another. And this is also the primary focus of sole sovereign identity today. But what we said in our paper is, well, there are actually two other main points here you are missing. First one, the second point is credibility. So if I show you that I am 23 years old, why would you believe this? Do you believe this if there's a government stamp on here? Perhaps. And the third one I want to briefly touch upon is the anonymization. Now, if I generate new cryptographic material, I can, at two points in time, be completely unlinkable in my data flows because they are signed and encrypted with different public keys. So nobody will ever know that this is the same person. Except, of course, if you have an IP layer in your system and these two completely separate data flows come from the exact same point, allowing everybody to completely see that this is one and the same person. And what we said is these three main components, these three categories, the disclosure, the credibility, and the anonymization, that is what makes a truly sole sovereign identity system. Now, this is all quite abstract, so let's actually Look at what happens when the rubber meets the road because we implemented all of this together with the government. And I'll show you what happens when this actually hits deployment phase and prototypes. According to our prototype, the, the Trust Chain Identity System or TCID for short. So what happens when you, you turn this really into a system? Well, first things first, what happens is your verifier, your issuer and your subject are all peers. They're all the same thing, all users of an application that needs to fill, fulfill identity flows, so the, the claim, the attestation, the proof, and the verification over some communication substrate. Now, this is still abstract, and I promise you the concrete stuff, so let's look at what this really looks like. And we'll use the internet as an example here because it's nice and easy. The bottom layer of our communication substrate is actually just the machine-to-machine -machine addressing, so it's just the IP layer in our prototype use UDP, so it's in the image for completeness. And on top of that, of course, you don't want all of your messages uh, to be malleable. You really want to tie this to the machine itself, so you need some decentralized public key infrastructure. Now, this is all the simple stuff. Now comes the fun part. On top of this, indeed, to, to make sure that your separate identities are not completely linkable, we need some anonymization logic, so some heavy cryptography going on here. And only then can we delve into the disclosure and the credibility that is provided in an SSI component, really handling these identity flows. Now, if you remember when I talked about anonymization, I said that if you have an IP address to uniquely identify your machine, you are not anonymous, no matter how much cryptography you uh, paste onto this. So in practice, what we do really over the internet and something to think about for 6G, for example, is uh, right now we need intermediaries to obfuscate the source and destination of information. So uh, this anonymization critically depends on still random people from the internet which, with which you need a connection. Right. So these are the components. Now, of course, this is all just uh, very, very abstract still. And I did promise you concrete stuff. However, I'm not going to run you through any data structures or hash pointers or digital signatures. That's all in our paper. I'm just going to handle some of the high level cool stuff we can handle. Now, for your convenience, I've grouped them according to our constraints I introduced you to in the beginning of this presentation. So really, as a reminder, the, the first one was the privacy preservation. And the second one was the ability for this solution to serve as a, a, di a digital analog of a physical passport. So, so let's look at, look at the first cool things that are happening here. Well, what we see is really a shift in how users interact. So they interact now by proofs, which means that if I go to a store, I do not immediately share that I have 
uh, attributes, uh, credentials, things that I can disclose, I really only disclose it when I need to, which means, for example, if you're on the Forbes list, just having the, the membership to Forbes would already expose you're a millionaire. It's a bad idea. So when I go to the liquor store, of course, I also don't want them to know exactly that I am, for example, 25 years old. They have no business knowing this. So what I do do is use a cryptographic construction, which is called a zero knowledge proof. And that simply shows that I am over 21, which is all they really need to know for their business logic. Enough about the interactions. We can also do some cool stuff with credentials. And the first thing I want to show you is conditional, conditional credentials, sorry. which means that we can give a driver's license to people, have it depend on these people having an age. And without disclosing the age, we can still show that this driver's license is supported by a valid age. At the same time, if you also remember my, my precarious balance, right? You don't want to share too much, but you want to share enough that if you commit some sort of atrocity, people can find you still. We have the accountability credentials. So this is simply a back pointer to some authority that knows who you are exactly as a natural person. So you do not have to disclose all your data, but you can simply share the link to somebody who knows who you are. That's it for the privacy preservation. Second one, the ability to serve as a digital analog for a physical passport. Well, some of the cool stuff we can do here is an audit log, which means in our example of a liquor store, it's very popular right now, um, you can show that any time you sell alcohol, you only sell this to people over 21. So if a government comes in and says, have you only sold alcohol to people over 21, completely automated, you can send them a report that you did so. Now we've already seen the authentication attributes needed to uh, provide a high level of certainty that the correct person is holding a device and the revocation. So just cool stuff is not enough to enable the solution because there's also a very real aspect here of performance that is needed. And based on previous research, it was determined that indeed, in order for any sort of um, well, digital identification at a passport level to be useful, it needs to finish in 30 seconds. So what did we do? Well, we split our system up in two parts, one that handles the credibility and disclosure, the SSI component, if you still remember the system model. And the second one is the anonymization, which is everything below the SSI component. Now, what we did for the credibility and disclosure is we tested seven completely different cryptographic schemes. And we found that really all of them finished in three seconds. Actually, we also checked the CPU and the usage of, of the network traffic and it's all roughly equal. Then the second half, the anonymization, we tested this with our thousands of real users in our decentralized network, which I will not mention further. And we found that this takes, well, up to 20 seconds to establish one of these anonymizing links. Now, if you do the math, 20 plus 3, 23 is less than 30 seconds, so our solution is usable. However, in our paper, we do offer the notion that perhaps the, the, the focus on these three seconds and optimizing the cryptography is not just. Perhaps we at this point should also look at some of the network security and network guarantees to deliver this data anonymously. Still, I, I don't want to end this on a, on a sad note. What we can do now is digitally identify anyone without the use of central governance. We can protect your privacy and deliver you a digital identity means with, at the same strength of a digital passport. And of course, all of our code is open source, academically documented, available at the link you see on your screen. It's also in the paper, don't worry. And really, I hope to answer all of your questions in the coming Q&A, don't shy away from high-level questions. I've talked with lawyers and jurists for hundreds of hours. Please let me make use of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Kenton, for this uh, good presentation. Thank you very much. So any question from the audience? I have a question, Elias. Yeah, go ahead, Kamal. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's really interesting work because uh, you know you deployed it and it's a practical thing. Um, so from the contribution perspective, looks like this is a privacy preserving authentication problem, uh, right? I mean, uh, I'm trying to understand how uh, it differs and, and you also, also used uh, zero knowledge proofs. Mm -hmm. um, so what is what is the contribution here um, that you you had? Uh, are you using you know something new, or, or this is just a, a network security protocol development uh, and testing? This is this is the first question. Second question is, you mentioned that thirty seconds uh, thing. Is is this based on uh, a need? Why is thirty? Um. Right. So um, for, first, the contribution, let's say I, I, I previously had a slide that showed the maturity of each of these technologies being used in the system. Well, the mm -hmm. newest one is 20 years old. So it, it's okay. all quite mature. It's just uh, the thing that we bind all of this together and really make a completely different type of identity, which nobody is using. And that really is the contribution. We can do this. This is not, not alien technology. We can make this a reality. Um, right, and because you asked two questions, the 30 seconds, let me quickly jump to that then. So in a mm -hmm. usability study for um, border crossing, this was discovered that really after uh, running this by a few real people, that 30 seconds is really the, the upper limit. At, at that point, people just give up and then your border crossing is invalid people just go away. I see. So for that protocol uh, implementation that you, you showed the uh, um, uh, stack layers, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you showed that you have PKI and anonymization. Uh, so was that something that you implemented? You changed the protocol stack or this, everything was implemented at the application layer uh, and, and you have that as a new uh, protocol? Uh, well, I can be very short about that. Absolutely not. Most of this was completely handmade specifically by our lab to really fit into a decentralized context. So things like Tor use directory servers. We, we cannot do with that. So a directory servers list the available, um, well, basically endpoints for pass through your overlay network where you write information, let's say. And really what, what we did is basically from the, the IP layer upward, we made everything ourselves and we've been doing so for 14 years in our lab by now. And this is also part of the reason why we're working with the Dutch government because we have this unique tool set we can apply to these, well, let's say novel problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just wonder if, if it's easy to deploy quickly, like let's say I wanna use it as an organization, I, I just deploy it at the application layer on my computer and and the users can uh, access it remotely and, and use it, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. is that the, the intent? Yeah, so that is certainly within scope. So we also have a port to Kotlin specifically for mobile devices. We have uh, this implemented on Python for really just online use in web stores, for example. And really it's just a pick up and play with it thing. And it, well, I, I already posted the link before. <laughs> you can check it out yeah, yourself yeah. if you want. Yeah, it's very nice to to post the, the GitHub link. Thank you, appreciate it. It's it's uh, it's very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Kamal. So okay, I have a quick question as well. Yeah, thanks. Yes. So Quinton, thanks for the very interesting presentation. It was nice to see the the system put together and. Uh, uh, this trust chain identity. Um, I guess one of my questions was also the one that Kamel was posing about the, you know, how does this leap from the established infrastructures that we currently have? But if you can go back to slide number two, I think it was 24 when we had that protocol stack. Um, um, one thing, again, looking at this from the networking perspective, one thing that caught my eye was the use of UDP here. I mean, we're talking about a system that is, um, you know, designed to be as secure as possible, that is going to be a part of a, you know, a digital identity and so on. So um, I understand from some point, maybe, you know, you had issues with uh, latency because you mentioned the three seconds and so on uh, kind of bar. So maybe that is the reason for using UDP, but tell us a little bit more about this communication substrate 
choice. I mean, realistically, your PKI is going to slow you down. TCP is going to slow you down. Even but choosing UDP sounds counterintuitive. So tell us a little bit more about that. From yeah, so our, our lab really comes from a peer-to-peer -peer networking background, right? So what we started with is BitTorrent. And um, what we saw really from real user studies as well, like measuring all of these BitTorrent networks is that most people really sit behind well, just an unreachable network address traversal layer, which we cannot just puncture through. So what we need here are, are like hole punching techniques. And so really intermediaries that help with establishing connections between two users, because users are not the same as, well, your, your data centers, they're not just connected. You, you really need to establish this with some effort. And why UDP? Because TCP hole punching is quite difficult. So you have to sync all your sins and stuff. It's a nightmare. So that, that for the internet, at least, that, that is why we use UDP specifically. Hope that answers your question. I perhaps I guess my focus was more upon making this truly, you know, self-sovereign and you know a, a truly sovereign, you know, system and making it as bulletproof as possible, because that is a strong claim that was made in the title of the paper. Uh, maybe as future work, are you considering, you know, battling through, you know, a TCP implementation of this, just to try to make it a little bit more uh, robust and secure, as uh, said, yeah, sure. all the so, same uh, exchanges. Uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, the, the reason why we have in this system stack a, a difference between uh, the overlays and the communication substrate is that the communication substrate is meant to be modular. So that at some point we can do away with this stuff uh, that we need for the internet and have a new beautiful communication substrate protocol that really does all of this network security and anonymity for us. And that, that is really the grand vision. Like at some point we really want to be somewhere where there is no internet, no, nothing. You can just slap your phones together and identify. And that is how I see the future. Where were you? Thanks, Quint. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shelley. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. So thank you very much, Kenton, for this great presentation. Thank you.